If you are visiting with us, uh, welcome once again. We are looking uh, over the last several weeks, uh, at this point now, we're probably on a couple of months at this point, uh, we've been looking at the fruit of the Spirit as we find in Galatians chapter 5. Uh, and, you know, since I don't know where all of you are from or what your background is, I want to just read that really quickly, uh, just sort of set the tone for what we're doing here today. And so in Galatians chapter 5, uh, starting in about verse 19, it says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. And so we've been looking at uh, the fruit of the Spirit as we find it there. But what we did or what we've discovered, what we've noticed is, uh, as it says there, the fruit of the Spirit comes about by us keeping in step or walking with the Spirit, letting the Spirit work uh, in us. We then saw that Jesus will talk about bearing fruit uh, when he talks about in the Gospels uh, the metaphor of the vine and the branches, where he says, I'm the vine, you are the branches, and if you abide in me, then you will bear much fruit. And so what we've been doing then is we've been looking at each of these fruits in turn uh, as they were modeled by Jesus Christ. And we're doing that because of those ideas that when we abide in Christ and he abides in us, that's how we bring forth fruit, right? It's not of ourselves that we do this thing. Uh, and because earlier in that Galatian letter, in Galatians chapter 2, uh, Paul will say something similar when he says in verse 20 that I'm crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but it's Christ Jesus who lives in me. And so as Jesus lives in us, we should find those fruits fruits of the Spirit coming out in our lives, and they should mirror or model how Jesus demonstrated them in his life. And so as we've gone through that list, we started out looking at this idea of how Jesus modeled love, specifically uh, in his coming and his dying for us, and in the story that we see just before that uh, in the washing of the disciples' feet, where it says that Jesus loved them till the end, and then he did that. And we saw that the love of Jesus is a love of humility and service and taking care of the needs of others. We looked at the idea of joy as we saw it there, and the joy of Jesus was found in the revealing, uh, in the execution, and the completion of God's will, specifically as it pertained to the salvation of man. Uh, we saw peace, and that's an important idea in many of our minds right now. But what we saw is that the peace of Jesus Jesus is not just a peace like in the world. It's not just a freedom from conflict. That's a side effect of the true peace of Jesus. And the true peace of Jesus uh, was not as the world gives, but it's a freedom from fear and from sorrow because we know that Jesus has already overcome the world and now he lives in us. And then last time we looked at this idea of patience, or your translation may say long-suffering. Uh, and we connected that idea to his mercy, uh, which leads to eternal life. And we see the patience of Jesus. Paul says that the patience of Jesus was shown towards him, and it resulted in his salvation. And we saw that the patience of Jesus when he was on the earth uh, was connected to uh, how he dealt with people. It was connected to uh, waiting on the timing of God and on his plan, and it was connected to enduring the sufferings uh, that he had to endure. And so we think of patience, uh, that perfect patience of Jesus that Paul talked about uh, is seen in those three areas in its completeness. So today we're going to focus on this idea of kindness. Uh, and I want to do something uh, just slightly different than we've been doing, uh, and that is let's think about this word for a minute, right? Most of us understand the idea of love or of joy or of patience, right? Peace. We get what those words mean. But kindness is an interesting word because if I asked you, what does kindness mean? What does it mean to be kind? What's that word mean, right? And when you start thinking about it, you kind of go, uh, I don't know, it's, it's just like this thing, right? It's just, you're nice. 
right? Isn't that what kindness is? It's just being nice. Uh, and if you look up the word uh, in the dictionary, you'll find a similar sort uh, of vague, nebulous definition, perhaps. Uh, kindness, of course, like many of our English words, when you look them up, it will say it's the state or quality of being kind. And you're like, well, that's not really that helpful at all, right? Okay, great. You didn't help me one bit. Um, but then you look up kind, right? And kind, it says, you know, a good or benevolent nature, a friendly feeling, a liking, right? And you kind of go, is that what it's talking about when he says the fruit of the Spirit is kindness? That it's just sort of a, a friendly nature. Is that what it means, right? And so I went and I looked up what's the actual word in the original language, which I don't do a whole lot, but this one was interesting. Uh, if you're interested, it's krestades, right? That's the Greek word that's there in the original language. But when you look that up, it's super interesting because you go and it says, that's a noun, okay? I know what a noun is, right? But when I look up a noun, it says, it's a noun, but it comes from an adjective. You go, Okay, so a noun is a person, place, or a thing, so it's a thing, uh, and it's based on an adjective, a describing word, and I go, and that adjective is based on a verb, and you go, okay, okay, so the verb is an action, all right, so it's, it's sort of a state of being, it's something that describes my being in the way that I act, all right, got it, and then the actual word itself, the verb it's based on means to provide what is suitable or useful. And that's not what I expected at the end of that chain. When I say, what does it mean to be kind uh, in the New Testament definition? It means to be of such a nature that you provide what is suitable or useful for others. So when we think about the kindness of Jesus and we think about the kindness as expressed by the fruit of the Spirit, uh, what it means is that we have to have such a nature that we do for others what is beneficial or useful or suitable in a given circumstance for them. That word is found 10 times in the New Testament, right? When you look through and you find it in the New Testament, you'll find it 10 times. Nine of those are going to be of God, the kindness of God, how God is kind towards us, uh, or they will be in relation to people, but only in their connection as disciples of Christ, right? So you won't find that word just describing people in general in the New Testament. Uh, it'll be very much like our scripture reading we had a moment ago, right? We saw what God has done for us, how he provided us for it in this way, and he did that so that throughout time he can show his goodness and his kindness in Christ Jesus towards us, right? That's how we generally find it. The other one time you'll find it, it will be in reference to man, but when you see it, it's in the negative, right? And that's in uh, Romans chapter 3 and verse 12, where Paul will be citing from the Old Testament, and he'll say there uh, that all have turned aside, all have become corrupt. There is none who does, yours may say, good, or that word is actually kindness. There is none who does kindness. So in the New Testament, when we see this idea of providing what is suitable and useful, uh, the only time it's talked about man on his own, it's that he doesn't do it. And every other time it's talked about God doing or us doing in connection to Jesus or to God himself. And so that's illuminating. We think about what does it mean to be kind as a fruit of the Spirit. And so as we try and find examples of what does that look like in the life of Jesus, uh, you know, we... We could find any number of things where Jesus did what was suitable or what was useful, perhaps beginning with him even coming down here in the first place, right? If you imagine the kindness that it was that Jesus told to leave heaven, he decided that, came down here, why? Because it was good for him? No, certainly not. It's because it was good for you. It was good for me. It was what we needed. It was what was suitable and useful for us. But uh, as we think of that idea, I went one thought jumped out to me, uh, and it's probably because on Wednesday nights we're studying the life of Christ, and not too long ago uh, we looked at this idea that we see in Matthew chapter 8, uh, and so we're going to look at Matthew the 8th chapter, the first couple of verses there. Uh, we'll also show uh, the corresponding passage in Mark 1, uh, and I'll throw them on the screen for you so you can see them here, but if you want to note in your Bible, if you'd like to take notes in that way, uh, that's where we'll be, Matthew 8 and Mark 1, and the time we've got left. Uh, we'll start with Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, and then I'll also show at the same time Mark 1, verse 40. And so when you see that there, it says, When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him, and behold, a leper came to him, that's Jesus, and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And then Mark 1, verse 40 says, And a leper came to him, imploring him, or beseeching him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Me clean. 
And so as we consider or we think about what it means to be kind and the kindness of Jesus, I want to start with this story here of the cleansing of this leper. The first thing I want us to note is that in Matthew's account, it follows, you'll see there it says, when he came down from the mountain. All right? If you're familiar with your New Testament and you're familiar with your Gospels in Matthew, chapters 5 through 7 is what we typically call the Sermon on the Mount. Right? And so as Matthew sets up the scene for us, he says, Jesus is coming down from preaching the Sermon on the Mount, and as he does that, this event takes place. Now, I only mention that because uh, what I want you to think about is what do you feel like when you get off work? Right? At the end of your day, after you've just done your job and you're rolling home and you come in, what do you want to do? Okay? Uh, I can tell you what I want to do Right? And even in a short time here, where I'm going to preach for 30 minutes or so, and then I'll be like, like, I'm ready to take a break. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to get off my feet. Take it easy for a minute, right? I've just done all of this thing for you. What do you feel like after work? Well, Jesus, as he's coming down off the mountain there, this leper comes up to him and approaches him. Okay? And so Jesus, while he might want to be like, hey, I'd like to just go sit down for a minute. I mean, go read Matthew chapters 5 through 7 when you get home and start a stopwatch and see how long it takes you. Imagine you're preaching that to a crowd on your feet, and now you go down, and someone comes up and wants a request of you. makes a bid on your time. And Jesus, while he may have wanted to do something else, instead we're going to see that he does what is kind, what is useful and suitable for this man, not for himself. Secondly, that we'll see is that this leper approaches Jesus when he has a crowd around him. You see that there? Jesus comes down from the mountain. He's been preaching to these people. He's got a crowd of people with him. And this guy comes up to Jesus, and he's a leper. Okay? Now, if you know anything about this time and leprosy, it's a communicable skin disease. And people that had it were shunned. You did not get around those people. Okay? It was, nope, nope, stay away. This guy comes right up to Jesus and falls down in front of him, not six feet away, mind you. Right? He's right there in front of him, at his feet. He falls down. We can even imagine him uh, as close as he can get to Jesus, begging him to do something for him. And Jesus, what does he do? How does he react? I'm going to see in just a minute. But the man begs. That's why I put marks up there, uh, sort of as an initial. It says he implored him. He begged him. He entreated him. He could have been weeping as he's there. He's begging Jesus for this thing. And what does he do when he approaches Jesus? What's the words that he used? Well, they're illuminating for us when we consider kindness. Because what he says is, if you are willing. He places the entire outcome of the interaction on Jesus' desire, right? He approaches Jesus and he says, Jesus, only your will is in question at this moment here, right? It's not his ability. He, he fully believes Jesus has the power and the ability to make him clean, right? He doesn't base the question on his authority, right? He doesn't say, Jesus, I know you can do it, but I'm not sure if you're allowed to do this right now, right? He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, you know, if you're allowed to, you can make me clean. He doesn't base it on his opportunity. The opportunity is there. Here is the man. He's right before him. And so when we think of kindness and we think about what it's about, right, kindness is not based on our ability to do something for another person. Kindness is not based on our authority to do something for another person. Kindness is not based on the opportunity we may have. Kindness, when we think about it in Jesus' terms, is based on will. It's based on our willingness. The kindness of Jesus is a matter of choice. It's a matter of desire. It's a matter of do I want to do what is suitable and useful for you. That's what Jesus is about when he thinks about kindness. As we read forward in our story here, just a minute, the second thing that we want to notice is in verses 3 in Mark, Matthew chapter 8 and 41 and 42 in Mark chapter 1. We'll see sort of the response here. Matthew's account says, And Jesus stretched out his hand, touched him, and said, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Mark's account says, Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him and said, I am willing be cleansed, and immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. The thing we want to notice sort of secondly here is what motivates Jesus in this account. Mark tells us specifically that he was moved with compassion. 
When this guy comes and approaches Jesus and asks for this healing, what is the thing that makes Jesus do it? Right? Sometimes we don't know. Sometimes we're not told. But in this particular case, we're told. Jesus performed this miracle and healed this man. He did a kindness for him because he was touched in the heart. He was moved with compassion to heal this man. It wasn't so that the crowds could see and go, oh, what a great man this is. It wasn't so that he could demonstrate some finer point of the law to the scribes of the Pharisees. It wasn't about anything other than just Jesus looked at this man and he felt pity and compassion for him. And he reached out and did what he could do. He provided what was suitable and useful from the heart and not out of compulsion. Now, the reason that's important is because sometimes we will do what is suitable or useful for someone else, but only because we're made to, right? Someone forces you to do it, either the rule, the law, your parents, kids, if you're out there, right? I'm doing what is suitable and useful, but only because mom forced me to if I want to have dessert tonight, okay? If you do something out of compulsion, it's not a kindness. You might think it is, but by definition, it's not, because kindness is an act of compassion, And how does he heal this man? It says that he reaches out and he touches the unclean one. Now, that's striking again because who's around? Who's around? It's a crowd of people. And my guess is there's a crowd of people who has the leper has approached, right? Here's Jesus. You get to be Jesus today, Gilbert, right? As the leper approaches Jesus, I imagine all of you who are following suddenly fall back five or six, seven, eight steps, right? Whoa! There's a leper approaching, right? They're getting away. This man comes up to Jesus, and what does Jesus do? Jesus not only stays where he is, but he reaches out towards the man and touches him. Could you imagine what the crowd is thinking at that time when Jesus reaches out and touches the leper? The crowd is thinking a number of things. One, the Jews there is thinking, what is this man doing? He's touching one who's unclean. Now he's going to be unclean as well, right? The law says, you touch a leper, you're unclean also. The other people are sitting around and just thinking, has this man no regard for his own safety and health? He could catch that. That's terrible. What is he doing? But he reaches out and he touches that man without a thought of how others are going to perceive it. And he does that. Why? One, I think he does that to demonstrate a personal connection with this man. He reaches out and he touches this guy to say, I connect with you. I feel what you feel. I know what you know. I want to do what I can do without regard for my own reputation, without regard for my own health and safety. I'm going to do what I can do to relieve your suffering. And it's striking or interesting because what do we know about Jesus and the ability to heal people? What do we know about Jesus and the ability to heal people? Was it predicated on touching them? Did he have to do that? No, we've already seen other accounts in Matthew at this time where Jesus can heal people from miles away with only a word. He doesn't have to be in the same city, the same room. He doesn't have to touch him. He could just say, hey, hey, whoa, 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 a little close, but I'm willing, be clean. He could have done that, right? And it would have worked. But Jesus reaches out and touches this man. Why? Because that's what he needs. That's what this man needs. This man needs someone to reach out and to touch him, to get personally involved, to say, I'm not going to have the stigma that you have ruin and control my reaction to you. I'm going to accept you and welcome you by making a personal connection with you. This man needed touch. The kindness of Jesus means personal, compassionate involvement. So when we think about what does kindness mean, it means personal, compassionate involvement involvement. The last bit of the story we want to look at here today is found in the next couple of verses. Uh, Matthew chapter 8 verse 4 says, Jesus said to him, see that you do not say anything to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for proof to them. Mark chapter 8 says, he sternly warned him and immediately sent him away and he said, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. When Jesus says this to this guy and he sends them away, why does he do that? Why does he behave in this particular manner, right? I mean, there's people there who saw. There was a crowd that saw, so it wasn't like, hey, keep this on the down low. I mean, people, there was a huge crowd of people following. They all saw what happened, 
right? But he tells this man, hey, do this, behave in this way. Don't go tell others that I did this for you. Instead, go to the priest and offer the sacrifice that was commanded by the law of Moses if you had leprosy and you were then cleansed or cleaned. That's what he wants. Why does he do that? And I suggest to you the reason that Jesus does that is because Jesus understands the importance of kindness being God-honoring, right? Jesus desires no glory for his own kindness, right? He tells this man, go do this. Don't go tell everybody Jesus did this for me, right? Don't do that. Instead, I want you to go off and do this other thing and said, kindness is not a self-aggrandizing act, right? We don't act in a way that is kind or uh, pretend to act in a way that is kind by doing nice things for people so that we can be seen by others. Now, I don't want to impugn the motivations of people that I see, but the best example I can think of this is you ever notice how uh, when someone, some corporation is going to make a large donation from some fundraising thing that they've done, how do they do that? Yeah, yeah, they show up at a sporting event, right, when the crowd is full of people, then it's, you know, televised out to the local community or the national community, and at halftime, they roll out with a giant check, right, there, that shows proudly how much money was being donated by their corporation, right, it's usually the CEO guy, right, or the head of whatever outreach is there, and he's there, and he stands there and he holds the check, giving it to the person who needs it, and he, he goes, hey, here, take this check, I'm going to give this giant check, so you can have this money. Uh, but first, but first, wait, wait, hey, can you hold the other side so we can take a photo for the good PR, right? That's not the kindness of Jesus. The kindness of Jesus is not self-aggrandizing. He doesn't say, before you go, leper, could you pose for a photo op with me for all these people here so they can see how good I am. He tells the man instead to do what? Go to the priest, go to the temple, and offer sacrifice. Give glory to who? Why does he say that? So that God will be honored for this man's cleansing. So that God will be praised for the cleansing that this man received. The kindness of Jesus does what is useful and suitable, not though we will get the glory, so that God will get the glory. And so as we think about the kindness of Jesus and what that looks like and how that acts and motivates our lives, we need to think about it in that way. Are you willing to be kind to others? Do you have that sort of uh, desire to do what is good for other people? Do you do it out of a place of compassion because you feel for those people, not because it makes you feel good, but because it's what's good for them? And do you do it in such a way that God gets the glory and not yourself? That's what the kindness of Jesus, that's what the kindness of the fruit of the Spirit is all about. Let's go to God in prayer and then we'll close.